Welcome to the Agile Wire, where professional scrum trainers Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky discuss agile topics. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Bubbles and Jeff Molesky. And we are recording. All right, Mr. Bubbles, kick us off, man. All right, we have a returning guest back here on the Agile Wire. We got Rob uh, Peeper, who Jeff and I have both worked with in the past and um, runs his own company, Responsive Advisors, uh, doing tr scrum training throughout the world. Uh, so welcome back, Rob. Well, I'm glad to be here. It's uh, always an adventure with with you guys in your podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know we're going to talk about something controversial. That's what Rob likes to do. So <laughs> he did that last time. Um, so Rob, just for those maybe who didn't listen to the first episode, do you want to give them some background on on yourself and where you yeah what yeah you've done where you come from? So I um, I'm a recovering software developer turned uh, Scrum aficionado. Is that the right word? Uh, I've been doing the Scrum thing now for God a ten or eleven years. Uh, got my got my first experience doing it working for an investment bank as a software developer, um, and they were going through an agile transformation. So I got the got the scrum bug by first going to a two day training, where I realized all the things we were doing wrong at that company, and. <laughs> How Scrum isn't just a whiteboard and a spreadsheet. Um, and came back kind of fired up. Like, I, I felt like I found my calling. So, um, I mean, a little bit of background there. I was trying to become – I was trying to do something new with my career. I was doing a uh, an MBA while f um, being a software developer during the day. And I'm like, what, what does a developer do with an MBA? I couldn't figure it out until I figured out consulting. So, um that was where, yeah, where I ended up going. I left that company and joined uh, another firm called Centair, which is no longer. And at that point became a professional scrum trainer and been doing it ever since. So after I left uh, Centair, I was kind of kind of pseudo running their um, Chicago wing of the company. Um, after I left that, I, I started my own business and focused mostly on just scrum and scrum training and professional scrum training and consulting and been doing that now five and a half, six years. So we've got a small team here that's actually based in three states. And uh, yeah, we've survived four waves of a pandemic and three administrations. We're still kicking. So what's changed for you um, in this virtual environment from a training standpoint? Train, uh, well, so the virtual environment is interesting. Um, at first, people were confused about how to go to a class in the virtual world where I was fighting with everybody to turn their cameras on and making sure that they were actually there and, and in person. Uh, that's kind of gone away. And I think people are just used to the drill now, or at least our communication with them has improved. Um it seems a lot of private companies are still a little bit shy to invest any sort of real dollars in training. So most people are coming as individuals to a lot of classes. Uh, so we saw a huge shift between, I guess, private and public classes where um, most of what we do now is public classes as opposed to a more of a mix. And um, I, I don't think it's anything we've done. So uh, I, I can only imagine it has something to do with the pandemic. Um it's easier to manage classes, I suppose. Uh, you don't have to play kindergarten teacher as much uh, in the virtual world, just because with the tooling, it makes it very difficult for groups to have side discussion. I mean, when you're all on one Zoom call and three people start speaking, nobody can hear anything. Uh, unlike the real world where two or three people can kind of whisper and have side conversations and uh, ends up, you know, making the teacher have to say, hey, guys, don't make me put you in the dunce cap area. But... <laughs> um, yeah, uh, th those are some changes. Uh, the digital tooling, I like a lot, lot more. I'm sorry, uh, were you going to jump in? Yeah, just going to add in like kind of like um, from a tech check. We, we've always done chalk checks before our, our classes. And just 15 minutes, like, can you connect to a Zoom? Can you go to a breakout room? Can you handle, do, you know, using like a tool like Mural, collaborative, you know, working space? Mm. Uh, can you add stickies? Do you understand how to zoom in and out? Like, is there anything blocking you here? Because I don't want to get shut down in the first five minutes of the class. And then all of a sudden I'm trying to help you tro troubleshoot your tech issues. And in the first, you know, six months to nine months, maybe even a year, I think we found a lot of issues. There's always one or two per class, it seemed like, with some student. But I'm, we're getting to the point now where it's like, I think people have done this enough with enough tools. It just, very rarely do we find a problem. And sometimes mm. it wasn't even the people. It was just like, well... Our VPN blocks this thing or that thing, but certain things have been opened up, and I just I don't find as many problems. Do you find? Are you finding seeing the same thing? Yeah, I, I definitely don't see as many problems nowadays as I, I used to in the beginning. Uh, we also we started off with a, a manual process. Uh, I believe Jeff, you were probably the one that implemented that when you were working with us. Uh, we had a manual process where people would um, uh, 
they would get in touch with us before the class, talk with us for 15 minutes, make them walk through a series of steps. And if everything was good, they were good to go. And we marked them off as pre-checked. Um, but we've automated that process since. And basically what we do is an email gets sent to them and they have to click a series of links. And if everything works on their end, then they just hit the last link, which sends an automatic email back to us to say, hey, I'm good. And that uh, sped things up quite a bit. Um, we would, uh, for a while, we were really, really particular about making sure that everybody had done their pre-check before class with the threat of rescheduling them. And it just got to a point where we were like, we're not finding any issues anymore. So we just got kind of lax on it. It was more of an optional thing. 80% of people do the pre-checks, but we still don't really have any issues in class. So yeah, I think it's, it's gotten a lot better. People are used to the drill. Um, biggest problem we have are like government contractors or government employees where they're not allowed to have. Uh, the tools that we use on their machines, like they can't install Zoom. So then they have to use the web version and the web version has some Zoomisms. Um, the, uh, the tooling that we use, unlike we don't use Miro, we still use Google Slides uh, that mirror the class just so we don't have to train people on Miro. And uh, every once in a while, people can't use that tool because, you know, they're government or they're not allowed to use certain tools that allow you to share data. Um, but I, I don't... I feel like... Inside of there, though, there was a, a good learning lesson about putting something out that was quick and dirty and fit for purpose. And then as you validated that it was doing the thing that you needed it to do, you went back and optimized it until it was fully automated. And now there's zero need for you to deal with that technical debt that you originally threw out by paying it down over time. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was, we had to figure out something early in the pandemic and we didn't want to take up, you know, 20 minutes of every single class to deal with, um, you know, can you connect? Is your camera working? Can you see the tooling? Does that all function? And we just wanted day one to be smooth and yeah, we figured it out. We nailed it. And now we just don't have any problems at all that way. Every class starts as if it were the real world. And it, we, we talked about this in the past, but just to give our listeners perspective, like uh, responsive advisors, I think by volume is one of the largest scrum trainers uh, through scrum.org. Is that is that still accurate? Uh, yeah, I think in the world we might be in the top five or ten. OK, so, yeah, we, so we think got a large lot. volume of students coming through. Yeah, so a lot of students, a lot of classes. Um, I mean, I can't even remember how many I, I probably teach about. I'll throw a number out there, 800 to 1,000 a year, somewhere around there. Like as Dude. as the company, yeah, I could look it up. I, <laughs> no, no, class, classes. <laughs> Rob doesn't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> we got other people that only teach for it with you, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, I myself, God, I'm, I probably teach 50 classes a year, I'm guessing. Um, I'd have to, I have to look at the numbers. I, I could be inflating that, but, um, it's, yeah, it, it changes year by year. Cause this year I've been trying this last year, I've been trying to focus more on, uh, developing content, building up this course management system that we're developing, um, doing more marketing related activities, uh, stuff like that. So j just to have that time, I don't, I pull back a little bit from the number of training classes that I do. And, um, but <clears throat> it's always, yeah, it's always a moving uh, moving target? I don't know. A uh, moving number of so classes. You, you, you were. We were talking a little bit about that uh, before we started recording. Just the the management system that you're building, and what I found really interesting was even you know you you trying to sucker Jeff and I in, into using it in in a good way, right? But when you're, what I found interesting is when you're making that transition. I shouldn't say the transition, but when, when you're in that product mindset of I want to build something and there's, I want to build something because I think it's cool. And there's, I want to build something because it's solving a problem. And even in what you were just talking about when you were, you know, trying to hook line and sinker Jeff and I into this was, Oh, this is, this is what it does for you. This is what it automates. This is what it's going to save you, blah, 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 blah. Like you've already got that, that mentality. So what I was kind of curious about is for product owners, like, have you been able to take any of those lessons and learnings and the way that you've been approaching um, really going with that product mindset of now I, I've got customers, I've got users, they've got problems that this my product is trying to solve. And how do how do you go out and actually find those those customers um, as you were first building it, making sure that you were solving the right problems for them, et cetera? How did you go about that? Well, that's, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, I teach the product on our course. I get to kind of feedback in some of my lessons learned into the courses that I'm, that I'm teaching. <laughs> um, but we're, so right now our only customer is us. 
Um, we get value from it because it's saving us fees that we were paying on Eventbrite. We finally just eliminated them out of our system after five years. Um, we, uh, we used to use spreadsheets and a lot of manual things until mistakes were getting made in the data and then we couldn't find things or we couldn't run reports. So I originally built this system to be basically the, the single source of truth for all, all data related to courses so that I could run reports on it, learn about trends, see what happens over the course of a year in terms of training classes. And it was helpful for the first three years to start to see patterns in, uh, in client behavior and the differences between, say, East Coast and West Coast courses. Um, the pandemic made everything weird, but still collecting all that data. So we've been approaching this as a not just build it because it's cool, but build it because it solves our problems. We're customer number one. And so my challenge now is once I get this to a point where I consider it MVP, um, it would be to find other customers like us that do training in enough volume that it's annoying to have to constantly send out emails or constantly do this or you know pay exorbitant fees to a, a payment provider. Um, find other customer or yeah, other clients that are like us. So I haven't yet gotten to that point. So far, it's been a little bit word of mouth, but it's still kind of under wraps at this point because I don't have a few elements that I feel would take this to a proper MVP. And ultimately, what that means is there's a lot of trainers out there that are kind of hodgepodging a variety of different systems. You know, they plug in a MailChimp to a spreadsheet and a spreadsheet through Zapier to, you know, whatever other system. And it might work. But for trainers who are just getting started, it's like, crap, I got I to gotta configure all these tools. We're trying to be that one-stop shop where, oh, you're training, you're doing OSHA trainings. Great. Plug right in here. Here's how you manage your courses. Here's how you're going to accept payments. Here's how you're going to run your reports. Designing it to be a more of a less of a one-stop shop so you don't have to plug in a variety of different tools, but have it be focused on the trainers, the, the, the training business, which is which I'm learning is very different than other businesses. Like it's not like uh, managing a classroom in college where you have 30 students and you have to manage their grades. Uh, the type of training we do is much more transactional. Is that the word? Uh, we see them for two days and they're gone. Like I'm not going to have them write papers and score it and have to track their assignments over time. So we just have different needs than a lot of the existing systems. And so we've been building it for us. And once it's to a point where I'm like, yeah, we're, right, we're at the point where I feel like I could show this to people and they could use it and get value from it. Um, we're almost there. So one of the later features we built was the ability to come to our system and create your own customer account with a blank system, and then you can start using it right away. But I don't have any kind of a licensing concept or, hey, now you got to start paying a dollar a month or whatever the, whatever the story is. Um, so there's a few pieces I don't yet have in place, and I've been just kind of like casually shopping it. But um, we're hoping the next few months to get it to a point where it's like prime time. Let's start advertising this. Let's start getting this out and uh, see what see what happens. So, and you had mentioned inside of their um, data, like you you have always when we worked together, you, you shared with me a fantastic amount of data that you were collecting on all the trainings that you were doing with the students and demographics and all of that information, um, which I always appreciated and. At Acorns now, our, our new president came in and really started dr drilling down organizationally the need to understand the KPIs. And I, I know, like, I, I feel like Jeff inside, you just like cringed a little bit when I said KPIs. But um, the the thing that really has turned my mindset around with this is it's a question or it's simply a lesson in curiosity. So we have probably like 30 people that show up to this on a weekly basis. And it's literally, I think, 12 to 1500 metrics inside of this document. And it's broken down by area. And all we do is by section. So we've got each of our product areas like earn, later, invest, um, uh, forgetting uh, banking. Um, and then some miscellaneous ones like mine, mine is the customer support area. So I've got all of my metrics in there. And all we do is just like scroll down section by section and anybody is looking at the data and asking questions, not from a perspective of somebody's hand needs to be slapped, but hey, this metric over here in invest um, w went really high and it had this correlating impact over here on customer support. It's, it's very, very easy, but we're often just asking the question of, hey, this went up, this went down, or A, I noticed this correlation. Is there anything here worth digging into? And I just find that exercise really, like one, it forces everybody to be looking at those metrics on a weekly basis, um, looking for those early indicators of, oh, is there something wrong here? But 
it, it's just bringing the masses to the table. Um, so people outside of your direct domain have visibility into the into the data that you're collecting and can look for uh, system effects, if you will. Like if this data point here moves and this data point down here moves. Um, so I guess where, where I was going with that is I just found it really interesting of like, having a good set of KPIs that are early indicators in the same way that your car has a set of KPIs, right? Like if you're getting low on gas, you have a KPI on your dashboard that lights up and lets you know that, hey, you're getting low on gas. You don't have to necessarily pull over and fill up the gas tank right at that point, but it's just letting you know, hey, you're getting low on gas. You might want to take an action here. Same thing with, you know, the check engine uh, light when it comes on, et cetera. Do you have any, um, so with that really long winded, uh, do you have any uh, type of like, uh, checkpoints like that internally as a business owner? Um, for us, the leading indicators are number of registrations. So typically people register for classes ahead of time. They don't, you know, it's not like the same day where they just show up and, and take a class. Uh, oftentimes we're seeing somewhere around the 30 day mark is when on average people are registering. So if I start to see a lower number of registrations for classes coming up in the future, I can fairly easily predict that certain months are going to be pretty quiet. But it turns out they're not always right. So in November, we were seeing registrations kind of dip and there weren't as many people signing up for December courses. But then all of a sudden December went crazy because everybody wanted to book last minute. Like the number of people that booked last minute in December was was shocking. And I'm, I'm always shocked sometimes by consumer behavior. Um, but we don't have like a check engine light. Um, we don't have anything like that where where um, any kind of a, a set of numbers is going to signal doom and gloom or, or anything like that. Um, the, the things I probably look at the most are looking at the average number of students taught in a month. Because below some point, you know, you can't really run a business. Above some point, you know, we're busy as all heck. Um, so we, that I've been tracking over the years. And at first it was very it's small and then it's grown, it's grown. And every year it's grown since we've started. So with the pandemic, we finally hit the point where we had enough people coming to public classes that it could sustain the business, even though all private investment had went away. And that was that was pretty scary for us with, with the, with the uh, pandemic. So seeing the shift of where the where the students were coming from, um, I, where did we see that? I mean, you just I, I don't know. A lot of this, they kind of run by feel um, when you start to see you're not getting any calls for private classes anymore. It's a little concerning, but when you start to see the student registration numbers going up, you're like, okay, maybe I don't have to worry about it as much. Um, other things I look at that are important to us are cancellation rates. So, you know, a lot of things we do affect cancellation rates. For example, let's say I had a minimum of, there has to be 30 students in a class. Well, if I can't fill a class, then I've got to let all these people know, sorry, we've got to cancel. I got to move you to another course. Some percentage of them are going to get annoyed with us and say, well, fuck you then. I'm going to go to another uh, trainer because they have availability. So we don't want to lose students at the same time. Uh, yeah. So there's a relationship between people who want out and uh, the number of classes we cancel. So we try to not cancel classes if necessary. Um, but we, we do notice the effect of like, as we raise our minimums, it does affect cancellation rates. And so we just, we try to tweak those numbers to get them to be what we feel is a sweet spot. Um, and that sweet spot changes over time. I mean, the more referrals we get, the higher numbers of students we get into our classes. And um, it's just how businesses get built, you know, reputation over time. Um, any other numbers we look at? I mean, those are the, those are the primary things. Um, I've got a, a, a built a pretty big dashboard in Power BI to look at all the data we've been collecting over time. And um, some of it's just interesting to look at, like, oh, look at the number of courses we've taught on the West Coast versus East Coast. And, you know, even though we're running the same number, why is there a huge difference? And so that actually recently had me looking at uh, competition in those markets. And it turned out that there was a lot of uh, a lot of trainers in other countries running a creative type of a course that was competing directly with the West Coast courses. Uh, it appears they're, because they're able to run half-day courses, they show up in the U.S. time zone um, when you do a search for the course. At least it did it uh, a month ago. And so you could be in Australia teaching a class and have it show up in California as, a, as an option for a half-day, four-day course. So I, I speculate that was sort of eating up some of our um, uh, classes that were normally going on on the West Coast. 
But anyway, uh, lots of data to look at, and sometimes it's just interesting and pretty and colorful, and other times it actually gives us really, really important business information that we wouldn't have known without looking at it. And it didn't like... Some of the things that I look at, like I have higher level numbers that I'm looking at all the time. Like a lot of times it's current value, like what's coming in, what's going on, what's my run rate. I'm looking at that pretty consistently. And I want to look at the patterns and I'm not going to panic about, you know, a month going down if I see something coming up, like that's all right. So I think that can translate over to any product area, like knowing your run rate and where you are as a business, like just a good thing to keep an eye on, Mm -hmm. but not get too, not, but not panic at the same time. Like you have awareness, but don't panic. And then like another one that I, that we always do is like number of experiments being run. Like we usually want to keep so many experiments that we're trying because we're all trying to innovate and say, well, this isn't quite working well. Let's try this or let's try this experiment. So how many De- experiments- define experiment. Like what do you mean know. by that? So one that we did last year was we started doing, we, we had been doing a, a newsletter. We're like, let's start a newsletter. So we ran a newsletter and then we had a sudden on a hypothesis that you know what, there needs to be content at the top. So we started a YouTube series of like these little three minute videos of things and we put them in our newsletter and and posted them there. And we thought people would get content value out of it. Seems like they do. We get a lot of clicks on those those little videos. So like that was an experiment we ran. Um, And as a side note, we have like our trainings listed under right underneath that. So like people can watch the video and it's like, oh, there's a training scene. You know, yeah, I've gone to training with, um, with Jeff before. So, you know, maybe I want to go to the next level training. And so you're remarketing to the people that have already had a course with you, they already have a relationship with you. So um, that experiment seems to be working pretty well. We've gotten a number of people that have signed up for courses. So that was like just one, but like now it's like next year, well, what are we going to do a different series? Are we not going to do a series? So our next one is like, we're not going to, we're going to start a quarter and we're not going to do a series, a video series. And we're going to see if we just have our normal stuff, like the podcast and, um, the stuff about the meetup that we're running and our courses, like, does that still provide value? Do people still open it and click on do it? Do they still look at it? They do? Great. Then maybe we won't add those videos because that's extra work for us. Um, and we'd rather spend that time training if we if it still provides value to people. Mm. If it doesn't, then we'll add that back in. So, I mean, those, those experiments like that that we're always running to saying, what what else can we do? Um, so that that's just an example. Sure. Yeah, in terms of uh, topics, have you guys kind of centered around topics you either like to talk about in your videos or topics that resonate with your clients? Yeah, so uh, the one we did was just like uh, Chad and I had this talk we created called for the we created an organizational agility manifesto, and so we just broke down the elements of that talk, and we just did like a video for each one. You know, it was like a two minute video for each one, and put it into our newsletter. So that was like the first one. So it was like an overview, and then like each element. So that was, I don't know, seven months worth of videos. So um, that's what we just finished. Okay. Yeah, I've, I've got a bunch of different videos on our YouTube channel I've been collecting over time. And um, I was sort of being intentional about it for a while. I created this um, video blog series called Agile B-Sides, basically because I own a record player and I just video recorded a record player. And, and, they're, all- and they're all like the highest quality as well. Like I'm super jealous every time I see them. <laughs> well, they're getting better. I got some better uh, camera equipment now. So the last couple I've made are just, oh man, this camera, it'll do 8K raw. It's just the video quality that comes out of this thing is just sick. Um, but anyway... So um, it, it turns out it's not about the video quality. It's really the topic. So I've got a, a one of my videos is at like 25,000 views and it's triple the next most popular of my views videos. I'm like, what, why? So for me, it seems like people are really into this basic level stuff, like how to become a scrum master without any experience. I believe that's the one that's the most popular. And it's, I don't know if it's just clickbaity, but people keep watching it. People keep sending messages. People keep saying, hey, I've got a, a background in nuclear engineering. Can I be a scrum master? And so I'll respond to these comments on the post. And some of them are just so out there. I, I, I'm like, ah, oh, man, I don't know what to say. Like, you know, you got a career in underwater basket weaving and you want to be a scrum master now? I, I, I sure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, the, the topics that I get really fired up about, like, you know, you should have a sprint goal. Nobody gives a shit about those. And so you can see it in the view counts, like a couple thousand views. Um, so uh, it, it really seems like there's a lot of demand around very basic topics and especially the scrum master stuff that I've noticed. So as I'm trying to build more uh, content, um, probably will focus more on that just to get more eyeballs that may then come and see some of the other videos that I actually find important. 
Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. Like, especially, I don't know how you guys are uh, doing with your numbers with agile, uh, the agile wire here, but uh, with YouTube, I mean, the market isn't that big when you think of scrum. Like if you look at the biggest YouTube channels with, with videos, they are not in any way competing with the number of views you get. If you put up like cats eating cheeseburgers on a video. So, you know, your expectations got to be nice and low. 25,000 views, hey, that's pretty good for a scrum video. It's really good for a scrum video. Yeah, yeah. if that were, uh, you know, a cat eating a cheeseburger, that would be terrible. Um, you know, you're looking in the millions and I'm just like, why do people get so excited? So maybe I need to do scrum cats eating scrum cheeseburgers and some kind of a blend there. But so I you I feel like you hit the nail on the head. Is there's there's a fucking game you have to play with YouTube. Yep. And and, I, and I've told this to, to people before. I'm just, I am personally not interested in playing those games. So like when, when we record the video, we just throw it up on YouTube. It's it's just for, hey, if people want to watch it on YouTube, they can. The vast majority of our um, viewership or listenership, if you will, comes in from podcasts. And that that is fine for us. Our biggest video is by far the Joe Justice one. Um and I think it's because I unintentionally made a clickbaity topic, which was agile at Tesla, right? Like you throw Tesla on anything, you're going to get some clicks on YouTube. That's just how their algorithm works. Mm. Um, but it was also a fucking awesome episode. Like it was probably one of our most interesting episodes that we've re- recorded, um, at least personally. But um, anyway, it, you, you had mentioned something else inside of there. So why do you think people don't give a shit about sprinkles? Um. I don't know. I don't, I, I, I just, maybe I'm just too nerdy about these topics and I've learned about them too much and I've seen every way people screw it up and sprint goals just aren't sexy. Um, how to get a job as a scrum master when you have no experience, that's a whole lot more sexy. So, I mean, a lot of these videos are getting organic traffic now. Um, at first it was, you know, whatever marketing push to get them out there and you get a lot of clicks, but then once that dies off, if, if the topic isn't interesting, it doesn't get served up by Google. Or if, you know, you're not putting in the right keywords, Google doesn't serve it up. But with a lot of people doing a lot of searches on the YouTube engine, they're searching for, you know, how do I get a job as a scrum master? How do I be a successful scrum master? But those basic level people, they're not even to the point where they understand what a sprint goal is yet. Um, so I, that's so I'll, my theory. So I'll steal, I'll steal some of your words and say, I, the reason why I think they're not clicking on it is because they're doing it wrong. They're doing it wrong. They're doing scrum wrong. <laughs> they're doing scrum. They're wrong. all they're doing like scrum wrong. Classic. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a big thing. I mean, every class I teach, it's, it's about correcting, uh, I hate to say correcting behaviors, but people come to the classes thinking they know Scrum because this is how we do it at work. And it's interesting because they all do it at work the wrong way. And it's the same wrong way where, you know, you've got this person who's actually the product owner, but they're not anyone you get to talk to. And then they've got this uh, user story writing secretary that takes all the notes. And then they've got the Scrum master who acts like a project manager who reports up to senior management, who's basically a spy. And you just see all this go on. You're like, oh. Oh, and, and, and you wonder why it doesn't work. So I try to focus on the, the whole point of Scrum being delivering useful increments and how powerful self-management is and empiricism is woven throughout the framework and just kind of bust all these myths that they come to class uh, either believing in or hearing about, but not sure what they mean. Like, oh, we can't do dates in Scrum because we're agile. And so in the product owner course, I kind of work them through a way to release forecast and yeah, it's a lot of a lot of myth busting. So a lot of people are coming in doing it wrong. They don't understand sprint goals. I, for whatever reason, have become very passionate about it as a, a technique to get a team to work together and, and really have a purpose. Um, and using analogies, I, I love telling stories uh, in the form of basic analogies that everyone in the class can understand. But um, yeah, the sprint goal one, I've just gone on so many rants about that, that I created two videos about the topic. I When I created the second video, I forgot I had already created that video before. And I was like, nah, fuck it, publish it anyway. <laughs> so. But w- one of the things I want to throw out, and I, I want to be a little bit careful here because they might revoke my PST card. Um, but I think the, the part of the reason is because you don't need it. Like you, you can you can get shit done in thirty days or less without a sprint goal. Like it, it's just like like I said, I want to be kind of careful here. But if that you just didn't have sprint goals, 
That's not stopping you from getting work done. That's not stopping you from being more effective than you were previously for going for 6, 12, 24 months with delivering nothing. Sure. A common pattern, though, that I see is that people will do that, and then they don't have a focus. And so everybody's all doing their own thing, working about, worrying about efficiency. Keep Jeff busy. Keep Rob busy. Keep Jeff busy. You know, like, do the testing. Do the developing. Do the whatever. And then at the end of the sprint, we get there, and guess what? We don't even have an increment. We have nothing that's done. We have all work in progress. And so like without a goal to line around, it's like, that's not my job. We don't, I don't do that. I just did the development. You guys figure out how to test it. You guys figure out how to get it to done. Um, well, so, so I, I give some pushback there. Like you're, you're fundamentally breaking another rule then you're not creating an increment. So what, what my point is, is, is if you created an increment every sprint and you didn't have a sprint goal, I, I'd say, all right, so what? You, you got work done. You got something out to a customer. You created a feedback loop. You're starting to learn from that. You're producing value. Now, again, like I'm not saying you don't need a sprint goal and you shouldn't have one. But if something were to fall by the wayside, like I don't think the sky is falling. But I think and that's why I feel like it's so commonly overlooked. Go ahead. Sorry. So I'm going to push back on you again because here, Rob, because don't listen to us fight. So... Uh, so you've you've now you've now taken some of the training wheels off and you've actually been able to deliver. Good job. You've you've got started. And you know a little bit about Scrum. But now how do you know what you're building is the right thing? Without a sprint goal, you're just building stuff. You're becoming a feature factory and you're gonna get disengaged people because they don't they don't care about what they're doing. They don't see the value of what they're doing. They're not working as a team. And so cool, you delivered something, step one, you're just getting started. Now let's figure out how to make sure we deliver the right thing. Yeah, and th this is this is what I'm saying, like back to what Rob was saying earlier, like when people are coming, they're looking for just the basics, right? Like if you can't produce an increment, I don't give fuck all about what else you're doing. Yeah. Like fix that, yeah. right? Yeah. Then start to layer on, oh yeah, wouldn't it be great if we have a sprinkle and like all these other things that are going to be awesome side effects of having the sprinkle. So like, I, like again, I'm not saying you don't need a sprinkle. Uh, what I'm saying is that is probably one of the easiest things to not do, but still be effective at delivering an increment. All right, I buy it. So if so, our, our takeaway here is like, if you're not delivering an increment, don't worry about anything else. Just do that. Like, do there for, get there first. I can get behind that. Okay. And, and that's kind of the trick to the way I teach people how to hybridize waterfall. That's a question I occasionally get. But like, can you hybridize waterfall and Scrum? And the only answer I have to that is, if you take a waterfall project and you make none of them longer than 30 days, and every 30 days you have a done project, fundamentally that's very similar to what Scrum is trying to get you to do. It just gets you there in a different way. Um, so I'm like, that's really it. You want to hybridize the two? Make no project longer than 30 days. Heck, two weeks, even better. Two-week waterfall projects. Keep your Gantt charts, keep your project manager, keep all that stuff. And if you still want to fill all that paperwork out every two weeks, <laughs> knock yourself out. Um, but... You know, at the end of the day, we're delivering, and by delivering, you're mitigating risk. And then back to the sprint goal rant. Um, I mean, when you think of self-management being one of the biggest topics in Scrum that you see woven through everything, without a sprint goal, how do you self-manage? It's like, hey, I just know I have to crank this lever. But what if the lever breaks? What if something isn't going right? And we have no idea what the purpose is of our work. We still keep working on that stupid lever. Mm -hmm. Turns out I don't need the lever because our goal was X, Y, Z, and I thought I needed a lever, and I really don't. So anyway, you, you miss a lot of opportunity to self-manage around better solutions and innovate when you don't know the purpose of your work, and now I'm getting on a sprint goal rant. What else can we talk about? No, I like th that's f fucking fantastic. Like You should have a sprint goal. That's what the framework tells you, right? Like it, it not, not to be the, the, the scrum Nazi, but there are a reason why these things exist inside of the framework. So... Like, I think it's a good rant to be on. Like, yeah, you should, you should probably follow the framework and you'll be in a good place, right? There's a reason these things were put there. Um, go, go ahead. Yeah, I, I got another topic for us. So one of my pet peeves is even in our courseware, there's still like some reference slides to like story points. And I and I have a lot of, you know, new people coming through. They've, they've barely got started with Scrum or maybe they have almost no experience with it. And maybe this is their first experience. And I'm like, I feel like I an obligation that I've got to teach you this because you're going to run into it. But honestly, I hate it. So like, I'm going to teach you something. I'm going to show you something. You're going to be exposed to this, but you shouldn't do it. These aren't the droids you're looking for. There's better options out there to solve your problems. 
I don't know. What are your thoughts, Rob? What do you, how do you handle that in the classroom? I So yeah, the same thing. I get so many people that come into the classes that have no background in software development. They're not working on a software team. They've never heard of a story point. And I'm like, God, where do I even start with this? Fibonacci sequence, deck of playing <laughs> cards. I'm like, you know what? Fucking Google it. I'm not teaching this shit. Um, so what I'll do on the slides is I just scr scratch out anything I don't like while I'm teaching it. And I say, just ignore this. And then I just say, units of work or you know whatever pick your favorite statistic or I'll, I'll boil it down into an example of like moving boxes you know you go to your buddy's house they want to move and you got 450 boxes so i put 450 boxes at the top of those slides that talk about that look like burn down charts and then oh man we got into it and realized there's 50 more boxes hiding behind there so then that number goes up and so i try to explain it in basic terms and then you know get around the whole training them on story points and the Fibonacci sequence. I don't think anybody even does planning poker correctly anymore anyway, so it's not really useful. They just make up these numbers, they call them story points, and I, yeah, people just, ugh. So what what do you mean by that? What what do you mean by that, the doing it correctly? Well, I mean, it, uh, I have yet to see a team that actually makes it about the conversation when they do estimates and it's really just about all right let's just get a number on here as fast as possible so they look at a piece of work and they go oh that's a three right nobody challenges them they write a three three story points the whole point of that activity was to have a conversation about the actual work so we can come up with a meaningful estimate that the team can get uh, behind but all they're really trying to do is check a box yeah we have an estimate move on are those yeah, estimates yeah. correct I mean, they never are, but I mean, is at least closer to correct than it could be? I don't know. And so uh, w when, the, when the estimates don't really reflect reality, you see a lot of oscillation on the output of a team, at least through the numbers. And if, you know, sprint one, I got 50 story points of work done, and sprint two, I got 10, and sprint the next sprint is 100. Like, with that level of, of variance, it becomes very difficult to forecast a team. So, you know, you take those numbers, you put them against a, a, a long backlog to do a release plan, and you're like, well, it could be done in six months, or it might be done in two years, or it might be done tomorrow, based on the data that I have. <laughs> I mean, your, your manager's going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Can you please just give me a Gantt chart and a date? So, yeah. Anyway, so there's a million reasons why kind of just pencil whipping that, that whole thing is, in my opinion, doing it wrong. Um, but you know what? If, if, it, if it works for a team, what can I say about it? But can they release forecast? Can they give meaningful um, uh, numbers that we can make business decisions on in terms of how much do we think this is going to cost? How long do we think this is going to take to build with some sort of a range or a cone of uncertainty? Mm -hmm. uh, if you can't do that, I mean, ultimately, business people have to make decisions, and they're just going to do it without including us. They're going to say, well, here's the date, and here's how much we're going to spend, and here's all the stuff we want done. Make it happen. And that, that you just see over and over and over again. Yeah. And that's how people just feel overwhelmed. And they're like, well, I don't know what the hell I can do about this. And so I have no say. And then there's all this, you know, blame game going on. So I don't know. The technique that I like to teach in class is just like, here's a cycle time scatter plot. This is all your work that's been done. These are just little dots of like, here's the work. Here's how many days it's taken. If I look at 100 things that we've done over the last, you know, couple months, and 85% of them get done within this many days or less, I can tell, we can tell somebody that's like the product owner and be like, well, there's about an 85% chance, you know, one out of seven chimes, we're not going to hit this. So six out of seven, we will, we're going to get these, this number of things done in the next two weeks. So think about that. Like when we're pulling stuff in, that's how much stuff we should pull in. So do we need to, do we need to go down any further? Do we have that shared understanding? Maybe there's other things we're doing refinement that we can ask the questions to get shared understanding. Like how would we test this? How do we validate we were successful after this thing was done? And if you, everybody understands that and can have that same conversation, then maybe it's ready to work, be worked on. And now you know how many of those things you can do and you just deliver them. And if you, like you said, if you want to do more, you know, like forecasting, like further down the road, then there's other options. I don't know. I do everything in Monte Carlo's these days. I don't know. Do you do that or do you still do burn down charts, Rob? Um, well, I mean, for the work that we're actually doing, I don't do any of that because our my completion rate is all over the place. Like one month I'm actually developing, one month I'm not. So I have absolutely no idea when things are going to get done. I know if I work on them more, they're more likely to get done sooner. But without any kind of consistency on development effort, um, none of those graphics would, or graphs would even help me personally. Sure. What I teach in class typically centered around a lot of the stock curriculum. So I'll explain how burn down charts work, explain how it might work in JIRA if, that, if that's the tool they're using. 
Um, I don't think Azure DevOps has it included, which is the tool we use. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, then you're drawing it on a napkin, but um, <laughs> to feed such a, even a burn down chart, you know, uh, a scatter plot, basically plotting out actual completion times and then looking for probability of things being done in X number of days, using that as, as your sort of forecasting estimate or forecasting statistic, you know, you've, you've got a hundred things on average, it's, they're done in under six days. You can get a general idea where you're going to be in say a month or two, if you have um, a bunch of similarly sized items. And by similar, I mean, you know, one's not six months of work and another one is five minutes of work. Like that would just create too much yep, statistical yep. variance. But um, I, yeah, Monte Carlo analysis I've used in a talk once um, in order to forecast completion dates of a large chunk of work based on, you know, the performance of a team and its variance and a bunch of those things. And mainly to get that those confidence intervals where, oh, we're 99% likely to have this be under a million dollars worth of work. Um, but, you know, if you want it for cheap, then we've got to stabilize some things. If you've got a highly variant uh, development, development team, um, you end up with a wild combination of options uh, in terms of what projects are going to end up costing or when they're going to be done. Yeah, I, I skip over a lot of that curriculum um, in our courses where we have the burn down charts and we talk about forecast, forecasting. And I think it, to me, it seems like a little bit of an older way. I mean, I've been back in our days when Jeff and I were working together on scrum teams, that's what we did. And that, you know, that's a long time ago. And the, a better way we found now, um, and I've helped a lot of product owners use this is this Monte Carlos. And it changed, it's a change in mindset with your stakeholders that you have to get people um, used to. They have a very um, deterministic uh, point of view in a lot of organizations like it will be January 1st that you get this thing done by and we have to change that to a, there's a probabilistic uh, mindset and so there is an 85% chance we will get it done by January 1st but there's a 95% chance that it will be February 1st you know before before so you know and there's a 50 50 chance it could be you know December 1st I, I mean we could hit that you know um, and just playing odds, it's like if you were sitting at the poker table and you had 85% odds, you take that bet every single time. You'd be happy with that. So you got to think about it in a business, like how big of an investment are we making and what are odds? And I think when you start thinking about it that way, um, you can then ask questions, well, what would increase our odds of, of winning this or getting this? What would go from 85 to 90? What do we got to do to do that? And then we can talk about different options that we have, or we can say, well, you know, we didn't get quite these things done. We ran into this technical debt, whatever else. We're probably more now at an 80% chance of hitting that January 1st because of what we learned. Um, here's some options to get it back to 85, or we could go with 80. Are you, what, are you, what are you thinking, stakeholders? Like, what's what's more important at this point, you know? And and that's how you can have good conversations about risk mitigation um, is by having that that, that that there. It's a great tool to, to get shared understanding. Sure. That's that's pretty much how I've been running for I don't know the past three months now with the team. So we were talking how we got onto this was the the, the pointing stuff and there's actually a really slick plugin for Slack uh, for planning poker where you can just like quick command in there and then the title and then each team member can throw it and it's just really really straightforward. So now to their their credit, like I'm thinking distinctly, we just had one on Monday and we threw this thing out there. One person had a one. Two people had a three and one person had an eight. Um, and like immediately it was like, hey, Tyler, you threw that eight. What, what are you thinking there? And like we had a conversation about it. And he was like, oh, we've got to do this and this and this. And I was like, oh, actually, like we're, we're not going to we're not going to do any of that. Like this is just bare bones. Get some information, provide a document. That's it. Like that's all we're doing. We don't have to worry about any of that stuff. He's like, oh, OK, yeah, that totally makes sense. I would totally come down to something like this. Right. And then it's, hey, Chamath, you threw the one. What were you thinking? Right. And it like at least making sure that those bookends have that conversation back to Rob, what you were talking about, like, let's just make sure we have a common understanding of what we're actually going to do with this thing. And the number just lets us know, you know, basically, do we have a common understanding or are we off with our, with our deltas here? Um, but then the, the, the last thing is like, I don't give a fuck what that number is. Like I don't use it because when I do the Monte Carlo forecasting, I just do straight throughput. So I'm just looking at how many things they got done sprint over sprint. And like, they are wildly consistent. Like, I don't think anybody else is looking at this, but if, if you just threw the story points away, like I, I don't think they would be nearly as consistent as the actual throughput is with the team. Most of the teams I work with are the same way. Like it's within a range of a couple one way or another. Yeah, it, it, I, I was really surprised when I looked at it. And then 
Like at, at some point I'm going to let them know, but I, I still find value in the conversations that we're having about the thing back to, again, what Rob, you were talking about. Like, I feel like we've got the spirit of what that number is there to facilitate, which is the conversation. And we find it productive. We find value in the conversation. Awesome. Um, and, and when I say productive in value in the conversation is it's again, not about the number. It's just, are we aligned on what we're trying to build? And it helps facilitate when we're not aligned in that. And that's the point of that refinement session and the, the numbers that we're applying to it. Yeah. Yeah, I can see that. That's good. So like back to Rob's point before where it's like, if everyone's just trying to like get a three in there quick and like, or whatever number just to move on, then that's not really solving the problem. Like we want to dip in mind for conflict. That's where the value comes from playing poker. You ever Google that, that term conflict mining? No, should I? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, all I can find are uh, things about like diamond mines in Africa with just horrible working conditions. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I, I forgot where I heard that term first, but I was like, oh, I, I want to Google that. I want to get some more information to share with somebody. And that's all I could find were just horrible, horrible things happening to people. Awesome. We won't do that. <laughs> um, oh. Well, good. They, they, they livened their day up a little bit. Um, I want to circle back to, to something because I was I was literally just thinking about this last night and it came up a few weeks ago when we were talking with Weber and um, so it, it's the the good old Centaur days and I, I, I'm not bringing this up to bemoan because I know that won't be an interesting topic for people to listen to but what I was thinking about last night was like one of the things that I am personally struggling with and likely because it's the new year you know you do some personal reflection there you're thinking okay so how did 2021 go? How do I want to make 2022 even better? What are some of the things that I want to improve on? And one of the areas that like just general growth um, has always been really important to me. Um, like I, I read two books every month. That's one is personal, one is professional. That's just one of the things that I've been doing. Um, I mentioned on the last podcast that I built a professional growth plan. Like I went into Marty Kagan's, uh, I think it's in inspired, whatever his second inspired, one is. And yeah. he has like, yeah, cool. He's got a, like a full chapter on coaching. And so I took that out and built this full coaching plan, like all the different areas so that I can rate myself on and see where I need to grow, et cetera. But what, where, where I'm going with this is one of the things that I really admired about Centaur was it, it had this culture of camaraderie and growth. Like everybody, like I, I never felt like it was competitive. I felt like everybody else was there to help support me and push me to the next level. Um, and so that's one of the things that I've been trying to to bring into Acorns and specifically like just getting a community of practice started. Like I, I really am, like, I think depressed is the right word, but I have a title of product manager and I have never worked with another product manager at my company. Um, I only see them in like a Tuesday, Thursday stand up meeting where we just go through status of what all the product managers are working on. But like other than that, I get very little growth. And so what I want to kind of throw out there to, to both of you having that experience, um, you know, how do you incorporate that culture of continuous improvement at your organization, both Rob as being the owner of responsive advisors and managing a team and a trainer. And then Jeff, like in your personal life. And then also when you're actually coaching at organizations, like how do you think about, or do you think about bringing that in as part of the thing you're trying to instill as part of your training and coaching? <clears throat> that was a lot of, a lot of questions. So sorry, up, sorry. Uh, basically you're asking um, about growth. Like how do I sustain a culture of growth? How do I create yeah. a culture of growth? Um, so I'm, I don't know where I learned this, probably one of the first small companies I ever worked for, the uh, owners of that company had this attitude of like, we were a fucking engineer, figure it out. And I was just like, what, what? And so I did, and I did my reading, and I did research, and I did this, and I did that, and it forced me to learn a lot faster than if they would have just came in and solved the problem when I had a question. So uh, I kind of do that with the people I work with. I, I throw them in the deep end. Um, I've been doing this now for a long time, even when I was at Centair working with people. And you, you just throw people in the deep end. You don't let them drown, but they think that they could. And because they're, they're in so, so much over their head, it forces them to rapidly get up to speed. And I just feel like people learn a lot faster when 
well, first they got to want to do that kind of work, but then when they get into a point where it's it's just it's over their head. It's 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 harder than they expected. It's not an easy challenge, and uh, even if they mess up, they're they're still far better um, at doing whatever that work is as a result. So uh, I mean, one of the things about getting good at being a scrum trainer is just repetition. The number of classes that you teach, just I mean, Jeff, you probably went through this too. I mean, I don't know how many classes you taught before you were working with us, but then you taught a lot of classes while with us, and you very rapidly sharpen those skills. It's not about the number of students; it's about the number of times you've taught that same course and run into those same questions, and you know, over and over and over again. So, uh, uh, um. Yeah, so all the new trainers that you know have been kind of brought on with us, um, you know, I'll co-train a little bit, but then I just get out of their way and I just throw them into the mix. And hey, if you've got a PST, I trust you'll do a good job. And uh, there's that. Um, so Carrie Ann, she works with me now, a replacement for Rosanna, who used to do a lot of the uh, client engagement stuff. Same kind of thing. I mean, she basically got two weeks worth of training and then she was just thrown right in, right into the deep end. And she picked up really quick. I mean, I gave her enough support materials so that she had access to the information she needed when she needed it. Um, we do a lot of training videos. So like um, if there's a process I needed to learn, I'll walk through it with a QuickTime video player on me recording everything I do and say. And then she's now got a video to reference. She's been walked through it. She can ask questions if she needs to. But um, yeah, I feel like just throwing people in is, is one of the best ways to get people to grow faster and giving them challenges that even exceed what they think they can handle. What's up, Boobles? Welcome back. S sorry, something something went wrong there, but I'm back now. I, I did I do. have a response to your question before. Yeah, that. yeah, because I want to hear it. Okay, so from a training standpoint, like, and how do you get that continuous improvement mindset? You know, a lot of times I'm working with scrum masters or product owners and kind of working through a role from a coaching stance or an advising stance. And one of the things that I found recently that's worked really well over the last year is I have them teach things back. I, uh, I got this analogy from one of my clients. He was uh, the president of the company, and he's like, I don't want my um, you know employees and people going into working with clients, the first time they take a hard line drive going across third base, to do it in a real game. I want it to happen in practice. I want them to drill that. I want them to be good at it when it gets to be the real thing. And so I kind of took that as a, I can do this with your scrum masters and your product owners as well. And so we practice like, hey, this situation just happened or whatever. These are situations you'll run into. I need you to do a teach back on how you're going to do that. What's the pros and cons of different road mapping styles? You just got to talk with another uh, product professional, uh, maybe a new VP of product, and, uh, and they want you to do it a certain way. Go ahead. Research that over the next week. Come back. We're, each of you are going to give a three-minute talk on that, why you would pick one over the other. And then Scrum Masters. Okay, cool. Um, um, maybe we'll just say, what's the cycle type scatter plot thing that we talked about before? I need you to be able to teach that to me. I'm a development team member. You have three minutes. Go. Go back, research that, figure out how you're going to do it. And then they hear three or four people teach it back. I give them direct feedback on each one of them. And they start, to, you know, they start learning from each other. Like, oh, Jeff didn't like that. Jeff didn't like that. Here's a better way to say this. Third, by the time you get to the last one, it's pretty good. And then I do it. And then they like take pieces of different ones. And they say, yeah, these, these are really good points. This is kind of how I do that. So they're building up this little bit of a, I don't know, they're building up confidence and they're also building up like these little segments of things they can use um, to talk very clearly uh, about certain topics. And so they kind of build up this rapport of, of, of things. So, and then they're not so afraid to tackle bigger things. I think they've got these enough basic knowledge in these different areas that they can venture out on their own. Cool. So that works pretty well. That has been working pretty well. I imagine um, it's a little bit more time consuming though when you're actually it, in a coaching engagement role. Yeah, it, I mean it is, but it's just like um it's a half hour like that we have, you know, once a week where you have a group of maybe four or five people and it's like a study group, but like we have a topic, they do it, they get feedback and then now they have that kind of that background to talk about that thing and going forward. It's one thing to hear me say something, it's another thing to do something, it's another thing to be able to teach it back to somebody else. So, if you can get to the teaching point, you're getting closer to that mastery level, you know. Really want to know something, you teach it. Um, but, you know, getting in that for everybody, I think it's a, somebody's got to want it, you know, to have that learning mindset. And um, hopefully you can help them understand, like, how this is a benefit to them. Um, I know we've talked about this before, Jeff, but I remember when I graduated college, like, I thought, yes, I'm done learning. I can finally just work and do my things on the weekend, play video games and you know, Netflix, all the fun stuff, playing time with my family. 
and I'll just do my you know eight hours a day. Well, that's not the way the world works at all. Like I had to figure that out pretty quick. Like like you said, you know, Rob is an engineer. It's like just figure this out. Like what do you mean? I don't know how to do that. And you just had to figure it out. And so, eventually, especially when it was at Centera, I think that's what it accelerated for me is like everybody was learning and then like if you didn't want to be left behind you need to be learning all the time like this is a continuous thing that you have to do and so i think you if you can get more people you can get on board to start doing that the more that becomes your culture um but it's it's like anything it takes a while to get that snowball rolling but once it's going it's hard to stop it yeah yeah i think some companies just attract clock punchers where you know they do their 40 and then they head home and do whatever they do when they get home but yeah, it's it's almost like it's, it becomes a cultural thing where at you know five o'clock everybody's out of the office. When we were at Centair, like there were still people hanging out, like either f- for fun or working on something, or there wasn't this sense of like nine to five. It was, yeah, we got the job done, but we we liked being there. So it wasn't like oh god, do I have to be here another hour already? Um, right. We enjoyed what we were doing so much that um, yeah, time just kind of slipped by. So it's it's it definitely feels good to be at a place where where you can feel that way and not not hate your job so much that you just can't wait for it to be five o'clock. Um, but then also being around other people who are constantly growing and then you're growing because you're seeing them grow and you, sometimes you just learn by osmosis. Where hey, I didn't even know that was a problem and you just solved it. Wow, you know you just learned so much by watching somebody else go through it. Mm-hmm. Um, things that you might not have ever found discovered on your own even. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to read a new book lately. Uh, it's called Why Nations Fail. Now, I normally don't read fiction, so th- this qualifies as not fiction. But it's not anywhere related to the, the business topics that I'm usually reading about. Um, and so far, it's interesting. Uh, talking about <laughs> Spanish conquistad- conquistadors uh, coming in and totally wrecking shop in South America and Mexico and how that was different from the way uh, the Americas were colonized and... Um, I don't know. Interesting stuff has nothing to do with Scrum. Sorry, I was just quick googling it. Why nations fail? Who's the author? Darren. Okay. No, this is older. Because uh, I, I don't know if you guys watched the Lex Friedman podcast, but he just had somebody on there who was talking about the exact same topic of why why nations fail. Like, what are the key indicators or commonalities? Uh, I just found that interesting. But yeah. Like, yeah, with all this talk of uh, democracy being threatened in the U.S., it's, uh, it's kind of, <laughs> I guess, a relevant topic. Probably. Any, anyway, uh, we're, we're a little bit over, gentlemen. Do you guys mind if we wrap this up? Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. So, Rob, at this time, is there anything you want to plug or promote uh, to our listeners? Uh, sure, why not? Um, check out my YouTube channel at YouTube slash C slash Responsive Advisors uh, for more of my rants and stuff I like to talk about regarding Scrum. Um, I suppose that's the one big thing to plug in. Lots of options for taking a class, but ours are the funnest. So go to Response Advisors and check out our online uh, <laughs> listing of classes. Thank you for listening to the Agile Wire. We are consistently inspecting and adapting ourselves. We would appreciate feedback at feedback at theagilewire.com or on iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play Store. See you next time.